You're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. If I think about some of the women that have defined Parisian and French history, I instantly think of Marie Antoinette, first and foremost, the long maligned figure of French royalty and one of the many unfortunate symbols of the French Revolution, the former queen has rarely been painted in a favorable light. But what if that's part of an incomplete story? What if new scholarship points to a more nuanced picture of Marie Antoinette and the empresses that followed in her footsteps? That's part of what today's guest uncovered in her new book, Marie Antoinette's Legacy, The Politics of French Garden Patronage and Picturesque Design. Dr. Susan Taylor Leduc, an art historian, previous guest of this show, and fellow guide who runs Picturesque Voyages, joins me today to talk about all of this, about the world's obsession with Marie Antoinette, her role within the royal court, what pop culture has gotten wrong about her, and the parallels with depictions of Parisian women today. Susan, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Lindsay. It's a pleasure to be here. When we first met, um, and and I first had you on, I believe it was in season four, because I think we spoke in 2021, uh, as the Hotel de la Marine was going to open in Paris, uh, you were finishing your manuscript for this extremely dense, heavily researched book that you have now completed. And and I'm thrilled that you are here now to discuss this book um, and, the, and the topic uh, that really does, I think, and hopefully we're going to unfurl that for, for our listeners, but uh, really does relate to a contemporary framework um, in, in terms of women's was discussions around women and some of the work that I've done. Um, and so there's a lot to unpack in what you've done, but I'm interested in your argument that Marie Antoinette and the empresses, Josephine, Marie-Louise, and Eugenie, are commonly misrepresented. Um, and as you put it, they are commonly perceived as profligate garden patrons pursuing ostentatious pleasures at the Petit Trianon, Versailles, and Malmaison. And your book then attempts to sort of disrupt this narrative, arguing instead that their gardens were liminal zones at the epicenter of court societies, venues where each patron demonstrated her agency and cultural clout. So I guess maybe even before we get to the specifics of... You know, why you looked at the at this aspect of of court life? Why are we so obsessed with Marie Antoinette? Because you know we, she's seemingly the the royal figure that we just can't get enough of, and usually in a negative sense. Well, I think that's a very important question, and I think I'm not. Um, I am an art historian. I'm not a historian, and so I don't expect to you know explain to you why. Um, the importance of Marie Antoinette historically, but what I can say is that she had this extraordinary destiny. She came to France as a adolescent bride. She reigned for 20 years. She was extraordinarily influential. And then she died at the age of 37, a tragic death, in circumstances that nobody could have predicted at that time for an Austrian princess. So this story has always had those who say she was corrupt and she deserved this death. And, you know, that's part of the French Revolution. And we have to take that anti-royalist stance. And that's part of the foundation of the Republic. Or a royalist apology that says we should, you know, consider her to be a martyr and a victim. And this history has been going on in the 19th century, even by Alexandre Dumas. But it got an incredible push in 2006 with um, Sofia Coppola's movie Marie Antoinette. So we have to understand that this was a luxurious, luxurious production. It was filmed at Versailles. It was Kirsten Dunst. It was beautiful. And it was based on a biography by Antonia Frazier. And there's a certain part of it that I think does capture some of the boredom and the ennui um, of of Versailles. But it created this idea that the 21st century could identify with this woman, that it was possible to go back in time and get dressed up and eat pastries and play games and identify with her situation when, in fact, we were very removed from court society. And so this obsession with Marie Antoinette 
has become, since 2006, incredibly profitable. It has become a way to consume Versailles and to consume Paris in much the way in your work, um, La Parisienne is an image that has been consumed and used to promote Paris and tourism and movies and all that culture. So to unpack this, we have to, I think, remember that she um, lived in a court society, functioned historically within that court society. And my point of view in my book in particular was one of the ways to understand how she could have any agency was to look at women in the garden. And it was the garden that was a space that allowed a certain agency that influenced all kinds of other things, but within the context of court society. And that is why the next series of empresses, Marie Louise, Josephine, and Eugenie, who were also at the head of court societies, looked to her as an example. It's navigating that social, economic, ritualized court society. So, so I guess then, in looking at gardens, which is what you you do throughout the book, both through Marie Antoinette and the empresses, em, empresses, and also looking at their marriage contracts, which is super fascinating. Um, you is it also a way for you to maybe correct some of the ill formed ideas about their influence? I hope so. Uh, I hope so. I think that their influence has to do with their agency. And what I mean by that is not only that they were garden patronage, garden patrons, but that the way that Marie Antoinette was able to navigate her garden, to create her garden and to walk through it, constructed a kind of embodied figure that was extraordinarily important for how people establish themselves in nature. And that continues way up until the public park movement and actually is influential for how we see ourselves in, in, in parks, even, even until today. So I think that that's very important. What period would you say begins the public park movement? The public park movement is at the very end at Eugenie. Um, you know, her husband okay. is really doing that from 1853 until 1870. And she's at that very moment restoring Marie Antoinette and Josephine's gardens. Exactly at that moment, she's saying women too had a place in the landscape, and I'm going to give them some historical, in fact, uh, a commemorative memory, I would think, a cultural and commemorative memory. So that's, that's important. So one of the things you actually do is call them curators of space, mm -hmm. um, and you're considering them in such a way that I, I presume is a way to understand power politics of the time. So can you dig into this a little bit? You know, how was Marie Antoinette constructing her gardens, you know, what is it about the design that was so unique and important in her uh, pursuit of agency and a sense of control? And then is it also a question of this sort of private garden and public space? You know, what's at play here? Well, I think that um, most people understand that the most important garden style in France in the 17th century was the gardens of Versailles, which we call the French formal style. And in the late 18th century, beginning in England, there was an alternative style that was called the um, English garden style that was more informal. And although Marie Antoinette may not have initiated that style in France, and certainly not in England, once she decided to create her own garden at Versailles, she created a space, curated a space, that was um, adopting something that was different from the representational public space of the French formal garden. So in retreating to her garden, she created a place where, as she said herself, I can be myself, and invited her friends there and retreated from court. So it's tempting to say that this was a private sphere and she wanted to close herself off and didn't want anybody to see what she was doing. But in fact, given her position, because she was a celebrity, um, and it's important to know that she's probably one of the first celebrities, kind of like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and kind of like Benjamin Franklin, okay, as the first celebrities that Anton Milti pointed out in his book that he first published in 2014 about what is it to be a celebrity. And because 
it was both public and private, a liminal zone, how we consider our place as human beings, both men and women in the natural world. Uh, one of the things I'm sensing is that, or at least I'm, I'm, I'm making, I'm getting the impression that maybe we should be more forgiving of someone who was, you know, essentially like the equivalent of the billionaires of today, right? I mean, uh, well, actually, the the person that I would say, and, and it pains me to say, this, <laughs> it pains me to say this, but in some ways, she's Martha Stewart. Okay, if if you think of Martha Stewart, okay, she made mm. a fortune out of making a simple life. Correct. You could you could live in your country house. You could have wonderful linens. You could make great meals miraculously. Now, if Marie Antoinette really did have all that staff to allow her to do it miraculously. So does Martha Stewart. But this idea of simple living, of getting back to nature and being simple, really, and then, you know, Marie Antoinette had scandals with her diamonds. Martha went to prison for her Wall Street, you know. And, but, you know, Martha survived, but Marie Antoinette did not. I mean, that gives it a sense of tragedy and destiny that makes her all the more um, intriguing. You know, how could it be that a queen was, you know, beheaded? So what I would say is that she is a celebrity and she is, uh, and we should think of her as a celebrity, but that doesn't mean that the way that we understand celebrity in contemporary culture is exactly the same at that time. What an alternative way might be is that she came up with this strategy of, I'm going to present myself as being natural, maternal, I'm going to educate my children in my garden. The garden is an extraordinary space of allegory and fertility, which is important to the state of France. But that strategy didn't work. It was a great strategy. Martha Stewart picked it up, but um, it didn't work in the 18th century because of political and economic changes mm. that she nor her husband nor the court were equipped to see. So, I, I mean, I guess if there were to be if there was to be resentment and, and animosity toward the royal court, um, obviously the king uh, w was seen as lavish and excessive and, and, you know, people revolted for a reason. But should we have put Marie Antoinette sort of in that same um, should she have been the target of the same ire, you know, because women at the time, you know, what did they have? What kind of influence could they have had over their, you know, over the king's politics, you know, and she was sort of born into this royal life, but this isn't her. I'm just trying to understand. I think we, we have a tendency now to, you know, categorically believe that the wealthy and the people with such power are necessarily um, abusing such power. Um, and, and there isn't the same sort of forgiveness for people who are in these great systems of wealth, except Marie Antoinette, it's not like she had a, a fully easy life. And she sort of was brought into this uh, without much of her own accord, you know? Should we be more forgiving of her? Um, I don't know if forgiving is the word. Um, I think that what we can do is try to have a certain corrective. And that corrective is what was the context that she was living in? What was she able to do? So in that sense, and that is in some ways, I can, I can discuss it this way. She was the patron of Vigée Lebrun. So she was the patron of a female artist and she gave her extraordinary um, capacities to do extraordinary works, you know, extraordinary portraits and works of art. And so she helped female painters. Um, Alain de Gouges, um, dedicated her Declaration of the Rights of Women to Marie Antoinette, thinking that the queen could intervene to help her. And let's remember that the women who were guillotined in the revolution were guillotined two weeks after the queen. So there was a moment that some activist women actually thought that she was able to give a voice to another uh, to give, give a female voice. It's d important to say that and to understand it again in context, but that's not the same thing as making a Cano Plus BBC feminist icon TV series that changes her into a contemporary character from today. I wasn't able to watch it, you know, uh, full disclosure. I watched the, um, trailers and I couldn't stand it because it's not fair to, 
go back into history and make her into a contemporary celebrity, like uh, as if as if she's completely identifiable. She she knew she was in a court system. She was much more learned than we give her credit. We have much more information about her libraries and her books. And when her husband kind of broke down at the end of the revolutionary period in the 1790s, she was the one who really started to engineer things, even as a prisoner. So it's impossible to think that this woman all of a sudden became engineering all kinds of, uh, of, of strategies of survival as if she was unlearned for the first eight years before that. It's just not possible. So we have to kind of reassess how we knew, know her. And that's been done through works of wonderful historians who have looked at her letters. Um, and that's important to understand and to try to fight against this Marie Antoinette washing that seems to be make her uh, something that can be easily identified with when, in fact, it's another time period. Right. And and just for listeners, uh, the, to, to clarify, you're referring to the, uh, you mentioned the BBC and Canal Plus series that was called Marie Antoinette. And it was, you know, had lots of sumptuous costumes and the backdrops were amazing. And, uh, but as you say, uh, horst- historians like you yourself uh, have called it grotesque and full of historical inaccuracies and that there's this desire to rebrand her as a feminist icon, but it's really taking it too far. Um to go back to um, uh, the rights of women at the time, you know, you're talking about her coming up in this court system. What should listeners keep in mind when we think about what freedoms existed for women at that time, uh, sp- specifically in the royal court? I'm, I mean, I think the assumption is that they were very privileged and affluent, um, and that ultimately inspired the revolution. But is it really that simple? I mean, you started to address this by saying she, um, you know, she was supporting female painters and she, you know, was trying to educate her children and there were, you know, so it wasn't just that she was interested in frivolous aesthetic matters, but what else should we understand about that time? Well, I think that women in the Ancien Regime, um, you know, in that period prior to the revolution actually had a certain amount of autonomy. Um, They were able to, depending on which class of society you were in, for aristocratic women, um, they were able to um, patronize, support causes, help other women, contribute to charitable causes when they were educated. They got an enormous amount of freedom very briefly in the revolution, and then it was all taken away. By by the period of the terror, it was gone. And by the time we get to the Napoleonic Codes in 1804, um, it's it's really uh, a terrible situation for women after that. The patriarchal order of the Civil Codes of 1804, I think that women in France still suffer from that today. <laughs> I, I would agree with you. But also it's so interesting then that the French are so... I mean, I think Americans, when we study French history and we study Napoleon, we do not have a very positive impression of his reign and and everything that he he did. And yet the French tend to take a softer stance on him. Everyone I talk to sort of will will, will point to some of the good things he did, whether it was, you know, even for setting up the... um, Oh gosh, what is it called? The, uh, the, the, the central conseil of Judaism even, or, or Jew, you know, Jewish matters. Oh, well that, I mean, yes. I mean, he, there's no question. He was, uh, incredible statements, an, an incredible military strategist. Um, there are things that he established for France that we still live with today that are, you know, part of the social state, you know, the, the sense of a functionnaire, um, the meritocracy, uh, it's military, militaristic. But in one particular area, um, the rights of women, it was completely catastrophic, completely catastrophic. And if you don't mind at that point, it's very interesting to bring in the two other women in my book, which is Marie Louise. Um, and Josephine. So Josephine um, was someone who grew up under the Ancien Regime. People don't know Josephine as much as they know the Marie. She was she was born on Martinique. She was married into a, an aristocratic uh, family who had slaveholding property. She herself came from a slaveholding family in in, in Martinique. Um, she was able to be a incredible patron in some ways, like Marie Antoinette. She relished her connection to planter society across the Atlantic and helped Napoleon with his imperial ambitions for 
not only the Atlantic, but when that failed after he tried to um, invade Haiti, as well as imperial ambitions to go into the Pacific. And she used her gardens to support these imperial ambitions. Again, the garden became a place for her to support her husband, to, to, to create this incredible support the colonial imperial mission and that colonial history you know it's very difficult to associate that with the history of of women in particular and particularly women in power so that's something I discuss quite a lot and then of course because she couldn't have an heir which was so important to Napoleon and the empire she was divorced for none other than Marie Antoinette's great niece Marie-Louise so the revival of Marie Antoinette which had also influenced Josephine to a certain degree really came back uh, from 1809 to 1815, you know, with a complete restoration of Marie Antoinette's gardens, which had been vilified during the revolution. So it's a very interesting uh, way of thinking about how these women each then start turning to Marie Antoinette and what she did as a garden as a way to lo- both legitimize and distinguish themselves in the relationship to their husbands over time. She becomes kind of an inspiration. It's not the same thing as saying that she's a feminist icon, but what she was able to establish in her particular space became influential. So fascinating. I mean, um, ju- just the, the role of Napoleon in upholding slavery and, and actually reinstating it a second time after it had first been abolished. I mean, I really don't think they're teaching that properly in this country. Um, you know, I, I learned about it actually from taking a um, ah, right. uh, Le Paris Noir, yeah. one of his walking tours on, you know, black history. And, and I'll tell you that, you know, there's a little statue in the Luxembourg gardens related to this. And yet, you know, I, I don't know. I don't get the sense that many people know that France had sort of abolished it and then reinstated it. And they're the only country to have done that. But anyway, it's a separate topic. Well, you know, I must say in the big Napoleonic exhibition at, um, at, uh, La Villette, they did do, uh, they did try, they did address it. I mean, there has been an attempt to address it, but I think the ramifications and understanding Napoleon's actions as part of a larger global trade policy, um, is what underpinning the colonial project, which for him was actually not very successful. I mean, his colonial project was not what worked, you know, um, and so France lost most of its colonies. But the fact that it took another than 30, 40 years for um, the assembly to come back and say, no, this is not what we want to do. Um, ironically, at the Hotel de la Marine in 1848, um, it's, it's another history. It's another history. So yeah. I want to bring it back also to sort of contemporary issues. Um, obviously, you know that I looked at the myth of the Parisienne in uh, in my book and traced it back to Rousseau, who you also talk about, and his depictions of women. Mm-hmm. To what extent do you think that the stories of Marie Antoinette and the other women um, that you, you know, these empresses, how does that relate to the modern Parisian woman? You know, I mean, you started to address this, well, you know, but the parallels. I'm interested to know sort of what you see as the biggest connection. Well... I guess that what I would like to say is, um, if we leave Martha Stewart behind, what I'd like to say is, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to look at Marie Antoinette and all of the Parisiennes that you presented? I mean, in fact, she was active in all of those areas. She was active in furniture production. She was active in landscape architecture. She was active in cosmetics. She was active in textiles. She was active in porcelains. So in many ways, she was an entrepreneur. She was sending herself up as a celebrity um, who could, through her taste at the time, um, help support the state and help all of these industries. And in some ways, you'd like to be able to take all of the women in your book and say, gee, she was able to relate to all of them. Jewelry, I mean, uh, the biggest scandal, the diamonds and all this stuff. There's all kinds of ways to think of that. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. I think what happened is the exact opposite of what, what, what you were able to debunk in your book, is that in some ways she became the iconic Parisienne. She became that, you know perfectly styled, everything in tune, wonderful. And maybe that's why she's so popular. It's because the myth of the Parisienne and the myth of Marie Antoinette almost collide and 
crash and then create this mythic idea of the perfectly costumed, perfectly cosmetic, and you can and you can buy it. You can just buy it. If you buy enough, you know, if you buy enough cosme- cosmetics, if you buy enough um, fashion, you, you'll be able to. And I think that there's that sense that that's what also keeps the obsession with Marie Antoinette alive. To a lesser extent with Josephine, because Josephine did very much the same thing. Certainly with Eugenie. We never really talk about Eugenie, but Eugenie understood this completely about Marie Antoinette. And Eugenie did exactly the same thing. She was at the top of her top of her game in terms of arts patronage, but to a certain image that, you know, got perpetuated and kind of almost culturally informed what the Parisian would become. Well, and they benefited from that, right? So there are certain individuals, and I mentioned this in the book too, that there are certain women contemporary figures who represent the the the, the archetype very well and sort of, you know, capitalize on it because it's good for their careers, it's good to make the money, it's, you know, so they don't do a whole lot to challenge these you know, these longstanding ideas that we have about women. So, um, no, that's super interesting to bring, bring together that, that overlap. And you're absolutely right. I mean, if we think about the figures throughout history that have really, um, that stand out to people, I mean, yes, certainly in a more modern sense, people might immediately think Catherine Deneuve, they might think of Juliette Binoche, even to some degree, but, you know, always women in the arts and always women who are, you know, in the spotlight to some degree, um, and and then that circulates globally. And Marie Antoinette, I, I I guess I hadn't realized how instrumental Sofia Coppola's film would have been in anchoring our association uh, of of Paris and and you know wealth and style to that figure in that film. But anyway, um, yeah. And, and and then of course it's not only her. It's not only Sofia Coppola. It was Madonna as well. I mean, you know, Madonna and the MT- MTV Awards. With the cones? For Vogue. The, yeah. Yeah. Not only that, but the, I think she did it in, I, I think it was in 1990 when she does the, you know, she literally comes out as Marie Antoinette. I mean, so there's a pop culture that keeps this going um, in a way that says her taste was so extraordinary. And we are always trying to get back to, which was extraordinarily important, for example, the Goncourt brothers. Um, who, who, who thought that she was, you know, absolutely perfect because she had this perfect taste and that notion of taste. And what is that French taste? What is that, what is that French savoir faire? What is that French je ne sais quoi? All of that was comes completely comes back to, to Marie Antoinette. Even though she wasn't French originally. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. She wasn't French and she was considered to be the, uh, there is that part. There is the, the Autrichien, the foreigner who could never integrate. And that's why she, but that has a particular overtone that has to do with revolutionary rhetoric. I think in its modern capacity, that's that's kind of been Marie Antoinette washed so that, you know, she's become to, to represent a French style, even though she was even though she was a foreigner at court. So when Marie Antoinette was guillotined, um, you write that the special mm-hmm. prosecutor seized her gardens as a tangible materialization of her corruption. So he purported that the gardens were a dangerous place that served as a backdrop mm-hmm. for the queen's clandestine encounters and impersonations. What was going on here? I mean, what? Wh- how did that? How did that association come to be? And if a woman were to be pro- prosecuted today for such things in Paris, you know, what would be the stand-in for the garden? Oh gosh, what would be the stand-in for the garden? Um, well, I think that. There were there were there were a number of events that led to thinking that the first of all that she would retired from court and gone to the Petit Trinon and made her gardens there and only her friends could come meant that this became a place where she was having a private life and was therefore excluded and not doing what a good queen should do and so as a result there was this idea that this was a secretive place. It's also the same moment as um, Beaumarchais in the Marriage of Figaro where there's all these switched identities and. Um, you know, this idea that the garden is the place where you could be duplicitous, but everything will turn out all right in the end. Uh-huh. So that there was a cultural way of thinking of the garden as a place, a playful place. Um, and therefore for the Republic, it had to be not secretive because gardens had been secretive. Um, they always had amorous places for meeting in a, in, in, in Ancien Régime France and the Republic, the new Republic, wanted to make it a transparent space. So 
getting rid of this secrecy, duplicity, dissimulation was, was part of that agenda. Then, of course, there was the diamond necklace affair where she was accused of stealing these diamonds. She didn't actually do it, but it supposedly happened in a garden. And so therefore, again, this was someone who was corrupting the court. Many of the ideas that were promoted during her trial are the ones that kept coming back over time. You know, this is why she was a duplicitous, frivolous, ostentatious, disconnected um, figure were, were part of the revolution. Where we would see this today, um, where women being duplicitous are threatening today, in some ways, what we could say is the fact that women are in the public sphere today and are out there marching <laughs> and being able to manifest it and use their space in the public sphere is what makes them still threatening today, is the threat today, you know? Um, and I think when we are concerned about who's marching and what they're claiming, it, it, that that is in some ways maybe a, a, a contemporary space hmm. for that. So how much of this do you go into on the tours that you lead? You you also run tours, uh, picturesque voyages or voyage. Um, you know, how, how curious are people uh, that you work with about the history of Marie Antoinette? Well, I guess I could say that I'm truly an educator um, because one of the places where the Marie Antoinette story is the most um, promoted is obviously the tourist industry. I mean, if you can put a Marie Antoinette label on it, it, it becomes something that people want to know more about. Now, might be that what they expect to learn is closer to the Sofia Coppola movie than what I'm willing to tell them, but I am happy to have the, and feel very lucky to have the possibility to talk about Marie Antoinette and even Josephine at the Petit Trinon, at Versailles, at Malmaison, to explain the complexity of these figures and explain these notions of celebrity and what they mean over time um, in the spaces that they actually created and used to create their own identity politics. So I, I, I find it a great um, privilege to be able to do that, although it might not necessarily be the image that people have expected when they book the tour. <laughs> well, I always say that it's good that if, you know, if people walk away learning something new and, you know, challenges yes. their their ideas. Or at least a more ideas. complex story. Yeah, yeah. It's at not, least a more complex story. Yeah, I think that's the thing. We have a tendency to re reduce a lot of these figures to a very simplified version uh, of what actually mm -hmm. happened. So you're you're sort of going deeper. So people can find your book. It is a, an academic a uh, uh, heavily researched book, and we are going to be talking about it at the American Library uh, sometime in April. So I'll make announcements mm -hmm. if that um, is also open to the public. Um, and in the meantime, if people are coming to Paris, they should absolutely book you for garden and artistic, uh, artistic, I say artistic, but, you know, museum um, deep dives because you have such a breadth of knowledge. So Susan, thank you so much for coming on to talk about this. Marie Antoinette is uh, clearly endlessly fascinating, but hopefully we've given people something else to to think about when it when they're thinking about this uh, this romanticized and maligned character. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure always to push these push these ideas that sometimes live in academia into the into the public sphere. And your work, your own work, Lindsay, has allowed me to do me and others to do that, and it continues to be inspiring. So I think. We have to continue this mission of complexity and rethinking and challenging that is so important um, in many levels for those of us who live here, as well as for those of us who want to visit. So let's keep fighting the stereotypes. Susan, talk to you very soon. Thank you, Lindsay. That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. Until next time, à bientôt.